Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here taking this opportunity to learn something new. We've got a pretty advanced workflow lined up for you. It's going a bit beyond just making a video of your landscape and going into making something really special with some video editing software at the end. Uh, this is a big topic that we're going to go through today, but our presenter, Pat Pavage from YTL Inc. has a great overview lined up for you, focused on a lot of the trickier concepts in this workflow to make a cinema quality video. You're going to need to already know land effects planting in CAD and using the 3D connection to SketchUp. You're also already going to want to have opened up Lumion and played around with that a bit. Pat's going to add on top of that with some video editing software as well. Really quick for our live viewers, you'll see the option at the top of the presentation window to switch from full screen mode to windowed mode, which you're going to want to do because at the bottom, you're also going to want to click on the chat window and Q&A buttons right now. So definitely take some time, click on the chat and click on the Q&A and open them bo both up. Uh, some of the video that Pat's going to be playing as examples of uh, some of the things he's made, uh, they're going to have music in it, but we can't actually play the music of the video live on this platform of Zoom. So what we've done instead is in the chat window, I have a link to a Vimeo video where you can pull that video up to the side and play it along with Pat, with Pat so that you can hear the corresponding music on your end. The record, we are gonna be recording this today, so the recording is gonna have the music spliced in no problem. Uh, then also make sure to use that Q&A box for any of the questions. I'm sure you guys are gonna have some questions. It's a, a tough subject. Uh, which we will be getting to at the end. And just a quick note that this webinar is going to go over an hour because it's so complex. So you're probably looking at an hour and a half for today. So uh, to introduce Pat and his team, they're very humble, but I have no problem saying that we've been working with them for years and their work is fantastic. The quality of their 3D images and videos that they've submitted to our yearly photo contests, which, by the way, you can submit to right now during the month of April. Uh, they're amazing and have made it to multiple brochures. Also, Pat's great at figuring out and sharing some very complex workflows. Uh, just recently, he sent in a video to us that helped us automate one of the steps in today's process, SketchUp to Lumion, and helped us to create a brand new tool that he's going to show. I'm excited. And you're all going to learn a lot. So with all of that, take it away, Pat. Okay. Well, thank you, Amanda, for that real nice um, introduction. Um, again, like Amanda said, we're going to be long today. And I'm sorry, but we, we just have a lot of steps to go through this. And, you know, what we're going to be sharing with you guys today is really how we do video presentations here in the office. And uh, more specifically than that is how we take that, that render and we, we send it through color grading. Um, to really try to give us a more cinematic feel uh, to, you know, to that standard uh, Lumion render. So um, let's get started. So my name's Pat Pabish. Uh, I'm with YTL Landscape Services. And YTL, we are in Westlake, Texas. And uh, Westlake is a suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Uh, we're about 25 minutes northeast of downtown Fort Worth and um, about 15 minutes just straight west uh, from DFW Airport, if any of you guys have ever, ever been through there. So YTL, uh, we're a full service landscape firm. Uh, we mainly do design build. Uh, we do hardscape installation, landscape installation, pools, pavilions, arbors, outdoor living. Um, we do a lot of irrigation. Uh, we actually design a lot of irrigation for other LA firms here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, Texas is one of the few the few states that actually requires uh, having a licensed irrigator uh, prepare all of your plans. So uh, YTL, we, we started the business in, in 1995 and uh, all the way back in 2004, we started playing with SketchUp. And at that time, we weren't building full scale models of our, of our, of our projects, if you will. We were only using uh, SketchUp for details. Um, arbors, pavilions, some outdoor kitchen stuff, just, just where we needed that 3D, um, that 3D look. Uh, 
Um, and then in uh, 2012, we were actually looking for some new irrigation software. And we came across Land of, uh, Land FX and we ended up buying their entire suite. And man, we have just become huge fans of, of the Land FX software and even bigger fans of their support team. So let's talk about our outline that we're gonna that we're gonna do today. You know, why 3D? Why do we spend so much time building these these big massive models? Uh, what does the workflow look like uh, going from a 2D platform all the way out to the to a video presentation? How do we go from Land FX to SketchUp? We're going to talk about how we handle large planting plans in Lumion to make sure that we're getting very accurate models. Uh, and then the video creation uh, portion of the webinar. So why 3D? Well, most importantly, it's clarity of design intent. So here in the center of the page, you know, we've got our typical 2D layout, right? And when we, meaning everyone that's on this call today, you know, we, we can um, understand construction documentation. Um, but as we are discussing this with clients, uh, and only using a 2D platform, you know, we can really tell that there's just a big disconnect uh, with some of these clients. Um, you know, why do we need a retaining wall or why, why do we need railing on top of a retaining wall or, you know, how do these steps work? And so by building these 3D models, you know, we can really uh, help our clients understand what we're talking about. Um, why we need that retaining wall, you know, why we need these rails, what's the traffic flow look like from that back door? you know, all the way down to this lower patio. And then it also really helps us to describe materials. So most of our clients don't understand what color rock is or granite or, you know, what color stain we're using on wood. Uh, we use 3D modeling for all of our conceptual planning. So here is uh, a project that we're working, uh, a new pool and pavilion project. And, you know, we've got an option A and an option B. And, you know, if you really just think, if we only gave our client a 2D bird's eye view of these two different pavilions, you know, option A, we would have nothing more than basically a rectangle, you know, four squares on the corner representing the columns. And then, you know, maybe a line down the middle for the ridge and option B, we wouldn't even have that ridge. It would just be a, a rectangle and four squares. So by doing these real simple renders, you know, we can throw these together really quickly. Um, we, we can really help the client understand what we're talking about and even help the guys here in the office. And then lastly, you know, 3D models just really help us streamline the entire design process and, and helps us close the deal. So, you know, benefits of 3D, uh, number one, it allows that client to visualize the end product. Um, number two, it allows our designers here in the office to detect problems you know, maybe elevation changes that, that uh, we weren't seeing or, you know, traffic flow problems. And then if we take that 3D model uh, and we put it all the way out into a video, into a video, you know, we can add movement and we can add music. And by doing those things, you know, you're just really adding excitement and emotion to your overall project. So we're always talking here in the office, you know, how do we successfully market each project? And, you know, what we've come up with is that it absolutely relies heavily on the customer's ability to visualize the overall concept, right? So this little park project down here in the lower left-hand corner, this is what we're going to be talking about today and how we built this video for this project. But, you know, if you back up just a little bit and, and, when we're talking with developers or we're talking with land guys, you know, they're used to seeing 2D CAD presentations so they can understand, you know, the overall concept of what we're doing. You know, we've got these roads and sidewalks and this little plaza here in the middle and, you know, some shrubs and trees. But if we'll send that 2D um, over to a 3D model, you know, we can really give them a much deeper understanding of what we're talking about. You know, over here on the right, you know, what size material are we going to be bringing in? <clears throat> Excuse me, you know, how tall are these planter walls? Uh, how do these benches connect into these walls? And maybe what, what color, what does this textured concrete look like? So that's what we're going to be kind of talking about today. And here's kind of the, the part that we want to play you a small section of the video. And again, like Amanda uh, mentioned, because of the, the, the um, 
Zoom app, we're having a little bit of technical issues. So if you'll just click on that link, you can kind of take a look at this. I'm gonna go ahead and play through the video for you. And uh, it may look a little bit, a little bit choppy, but um, here you go. Okay, so that's that's the video. That's that's what we're going to be talking about today. So here we are. Um, let's talk about this workflow. Um, first of all, all of our projects start in LandFX. Um, we'll do all of our design work in LandFX. From LandFX, uh, we we send all of this information over to SketchUp. And SketchUp is where we're going to create our three D model. And from SketchUp, we're going to go out to Lumion. And Lumion is where we're going to apply all of our textures. We're going to add some entourage. And uh, we're going to add all of our Lumion plantings. And then we're going to render out a video file uh, from Lumion. And that video file, we're going to then send over to a piece of software called DaVinci Resolve. And Resolve is where we're going to be doing all of our color grading. And that's what's going to produce our, our, final, our final video. Okay, so a little bit about the process. Um, again, all of our projects start in LandFX. We do all of our, our design work on the 2D uh, CAD platform. We do very little work, uh, any line work in SketchUp. Um, and then we're always gonna save out our base files as for Sketch. So project name for Sketch. And the reason that we do that is that there's so many times that we need to add line work into the 2D uh, platform to be able to communicate with SketchUp. And then we're going to export all of this line work using the LandFX 3D connection. And for those who may not know, both in the site tab and in the planting tab, we have this 3D connection where we can communicate all of this line work and send it over to SketchUp and send all of our plantings. Okay, so now we're, going, we're moving over into SketchUp. We're creating our 3D base. We're importing all of that line work. And then we're going to import plant nodes. Well, what, what, is a, what is a plant node? Well, this is a node. And by definition, a node is nothing more than two lines that intersect in space. But more importantly, we need to know this insertion point. Because this insertion point is how we actually communicate from SketchUp to Lumion to tell Lumion that we want to plant a shrub here or we want to plant a tree here. So here's just a little screenshot of our SketchUp uh, model um, for this park. And many of you guys are aware that the LandFX plugin can bring in SketchUp plants or SketchUp trees, right? Well, we don't want to use SketchUp plants and SketchUp trees. We want to use the Lumion products because they look so much better. Well, there's a real cool hidden little feature that many of you may not know about um, that is in the LandFX plugin. And if you'll open your Ruby console, and you type in this landfx.usenodes equals true, when you go to import all of your plants, you're actually going to be importing nodes instead of those plants. So we've imported all of these plant nodes, and now we need to export these nodes out so that we can use them over in Lumion. And again, using the landfx plugin, if we'll go to this Ruby console and we type in this landfx.export nodes, we're actually going, the, the landfx plugin is going to go through our base file and it is going to build a separate SketchUp file for each variety of plant that we have. Okay, so then we're going to jump over to Lumion. We're going to import our SketchUp base. We're going to import all of these plant node files. 
And then we need to swap these plant node files for Lumion plantings. And so over here on the screen, this is a little residential project that we did. Um, and you can see these little orange triangles. These orange triangles are the nodes that the LandFX plugin actually built for us back over in SketchUp. We've imported this file into Lumion and then in Lumion using this place object on nodes button, we can actually swap out uh, the node for a Lumion plant. We delete the node and then we're left with a Lumion plant in the exact location that we drew it over in LandFX. And so then, you know, after we bring in all of these planting nodes, um, we're going to add all of our textures, our entourage. We're going to render that, that video file out. Uh, and then we're going to go into this, this DaVinci Resolve. And Resolve is our new media platform that we run. Um, this is where we build a timeline and we edit that timeline. Uh, we do color grading here and then we render out our, our final presentation. So let's jump over to CAD and we're going to walk you through this entire process. Okay, so we are in LandFX and you'll notice up here we are in the landscape plan for sketch, right? And just to show you, you know, this is our little park project and, and just to show you a little bit of this temporary line work that we were talking about, if I click on this blue polyline here, you can see over here, you know, this is our boundary for sketch. And, and that's all that is. It's just a temporary um, line that allows us to, to set our extents of the model that we're going to build here. And if we jump over and just show you one more thing, here's all our temporary topo lines that we needed to put into this file so that we could build our terrain um, over in SketchUp. So you can see this is just on a temporary layer topos for sketch. And you know we've got this up at up at, at, at excuse me up at elevation at 661. And then we'll go into our planting tab here, presentation, 3D connection. And you can see in the 3D connection, we can send all of this layer work, or we can send our trees, we can send our shrubs, amenities, and now the new lighting feature that LandFX has added. All right, so let's jump over into our SketchUp file. So we're on our SketchUp file now, and um, this is just our base file. I mean, it's nothing more than that. We have our terrain and, you know, we have our beds built and roads and sidewalks and our little mail kiosk building here and swing set, our little plaza in the middle. So we're now ready to import all of our plantings for the file, right? So if you'll go up here into your window and go to your Ruby console, we can type in this landfx dot use nodes equals true. Spell that right. That's always awesome. Landfx dot use nodes equals true and hit enter. And now you have just uh, prepped the landfx plugin. Um, so that when we want to import our plants, we're going to be importing nodes. So you can just go over to your LandFX plugin, uh, LandFX import plants from CAD, right? And when you click on this, LandFX is going to go through and, and build all of these nodes for you. And we're not going to make you watch our, our, our hourglass spin here. We've already built this. Here's all of our nodes that we brought in. And this is what the, the plugin did for us with one click of a button. And you'll notice that um, each, each uh, variety of plant is a separate color and we've got some scaled nodes in here. So the plugin is going to go through and it's going to scale this, this plant node to the same scale as your block back in LandFX. And not that Lumion cares. Lumion does not care what size this this node is, Lumion only needs to know this insertion point. But it is kind of nice that LandFX built this for us. Um, you know, our small nodes are going to be our standard, you know, three to five gallon shrubs. You know, a medium is going to be our understory trees. And then, you know, our larger, <coughs> excuse me, our larger nodes are going to be our large trees. Okay, so that's our park plan 
with all of our nodes brought in. So now we need to export all of these nodes. So again, go back into your Ruby console and type in landfx. landfx.export nodes. And when you hit enter, the landfx plugin is gonna go through your entire base file and it's gonna build a separate file for each variety of plants. Okay, we've already done that. We're not gonna make you watch that. Um, so we can close out of this. Let's talk about how we export to landfx. I mean, I'm sorry, to uh, Lumion. Basically, we'll go through and we'll build two scenes. We'll call one a, a Lumion base and one called nodes. Now, our Lumion base is just our base file with all of our nodes turned off. Because when you're, when you're sending this base file over to Lumion, we don't want those nodes um, being present. We want to bring those node files in one at a time so we can swap them for different varieties of, of plants. So we want to make sure that we're on our Lumion base here. This is when we're going to hit save. This is going to be the last save before you send it over into Lumion. So we don't want this, we want this. If we have our nodes on and we hit save now and try to import this, all of these nodes are gonna be turned on. Okay, kind of an important, important step. All right, let's jump you over into Lumion. All right, so here is our Lumion base file. So we have, you know, basically just the base. Um, I'm gonna fly you over here to the origin and you're gonna see some flashing uh, because of the Zoom app. I'm gonna get you over here to the origin and we're gonna let, we're gonna let um, Zoom catch up. Okay, if we select our base file here and we, we select this little type in, you can see that we've positioned this base file at 0, 050, 0, right? And that's real important to remember because we need to bring in all of these planting files and we need to set all those planting files exactly on top of this base file so that everything lines up. So we can just go over here to import. And here are all of our uh, SketchUp files that the plugin built for us, right? Each one of these is a different variety of plant. So we can just grab one of these, or let's call it, let's grab this VC. We're gonna click open. I've got to rename this because we brought this in several times. and we're just gonna place this. I'm gonna use my select tool. I'm gonna to select that. And you can see I have uh, selected my landfx node vc file. And 20 is just because I had to rename that. We can now go to this position and we can move this file to zero, five, and zero. And now our vc file back here in the background is in its proper location, it's lining up exactly with our origin. So let's fly you over so you can see that. And again, the zoom app, you're gonna see a little bit of flashing. I'm gonna let zoom catch up. Okay, so here is my VC node file. And it's got a blue uh, bounding selection box on that because it's still selected back here at the origin. Um, we can now go in to this little fly out here and we can hit this button right here, place object on nodes. So if we click on that, go down to our landscape tab, we can now place any one of these uh, Lumion plants on our nodes. So you're just gonna kind of go through and decide, hey, what looks like a BC to you? We'll use this plant right here. I'm just left clicking on it. And Lumion just placed a tree right where we had a node. And we will click okay. So that's how we get extremely accurate models into Lumion. Um, you know, we just use node file after node file. Um, I'm gonna fly you back out to the origin because you need to understand something here. And again, zoom, zoom is flashing a little bit. Every time that you use this technique of replacing nodes with a Lumion plant, you are gonna end up with a plant on your origin. All you have to do is click your nature tab. That means you want to select something from the nature tab, click select, 
click your delete, and do you see that little icon right there with the pine tree in the middle? That means that that's a Lumion object or a Lumion uh, landscape object. If you'll just click on that, we've now deleted the plant that was at our origin. Important step to remember. We'll fly you back over to the park, let Zoom catch up. And all we deleted was that one plant that was back on the origin. You can see that we still have these Lumion uh, files in the exact location that we drew them way back in LandFX. Got that? Okay, so you are going to now just go through that entire list of files that um, the FX plugin built for you, and you're just going to bring them in one at a time, and you're going to swap each node file for a Lumion plant. So we're going to show you what this entire park looks like. Turn on all of our layers here. That's a nice look. I'll get you down here. Okay, so uh, here's our finished product. We have brought in all of our different plants. Um, at this point, we will go through the file and we'll start swapping out all of our SketchUp uh, textures for Lumion textures. We'll add entourage, you know, people, dogs, cars. Um, we'll add lighting at this point, and uh, you're ready to send this out to the to, to build it to build your movie. So we can jump over here to this movie button, and we have already set up our our different scenes, right? Our different clips down at the bottom. And you can grab this up here and you can scroll through just to check out to see what your movie looks like. Let's just show you how, how you set up a clip. It's super simple. All you have to do is come down here to the bottom, pick an empty window, click on that, click on your record. And now you can just fly, fly out to whatever you think is, you know, important. You know, maybe you think that this rock is something that, you know, your client's really interested in. You can just click your add keyframe button, slide to the right, add your keyframe. Maybe we go up just a little bit, add your keyframe. And now you can just have a look and see, is that the, is that the clip that you want to show people? Okay, it's that easy. Come down here, click your check mark, and you've just added that clip to the end of your movie. All right, so let's talk about effects a little bit in Lumion. Um, two things. Um, we're not real big fans of all the, uh, the effects that Lumion can do for you. Um, two reasons. Um, one, I guess we're just not very good at them. Um, we'll spend all this time playing with these effects and we think that we have them looking good and looking right in, in our preview window. And then we render this thing out and all of our shadows are too dark or, you know, the sky's blown out or our, our colors are all over the place. So we end up sending it out to post-production anyways to, cl to clean all of that, that stuff up. So um, the other reason is that, a lot of these effects add a tremendous amount of render time. Now, um, this clip down here, if you'll look in the lower right-hand corner, <laughs> this movie is set up right now for five minutes and 20 seconds. We run extremely large graphic cards here in the office, and, um, and we do have some night scenes in this, which will add a little bit of time. But um, with our big graphics cards, this is still probably going to take, you know, three and a half hours to run out. And by adding effects, a bunch of effects, you're adding render time. Uh, things like hyperlight and skylight, man, both of those can add like 25% uh, to, your, to your render time. And, and we're not happy with them anyways. So our theory is just don't play with them. Uh, just kind of stay away from them. You, you can do everything that those um, effects can do and you can probably do it better over in your post-production. But let me get you down to an area here kind of show you the two effects that we do use. Um, you know, something in here is fine. The two effects that we do use on all of our 
productions is we will use fog. Um, and what fog will do for you is it really helps hide that horizon line. Uh, the other thing that it does for you is that it gives you a little bit of depth of field, which is very nice. Um, the, the other correction that we'll have on all of our productions is color correction. And watch my screen when I turn on this color correction. You see how flat the image just went? And let me show you what we're doing in there. The only two things that we're doing in this color correction is we're bringing our contrast way down and we're bringing our saturation way down. That's it. And what we're doing here, now we're kind of starting to talk about um, video production and how big film or big cinema actually films their shots. Um, most cinema is shot in a format called log, L-O-G, log. Um, and there's all kinds of different log, S-log, V-log, D-log. And um, the point behind log is that they want a very flat, very desaturated image because they know they're going to send their footage out to a professional color uh, grader, grading company, right? Um, and the producer and the color grading company are going to get together and they're going to decide what kind of look they want for their film. If it's a happy romantic comedy, you know, they're going to be leaning towards oranges and high contrast. Um, if it's a horror film, they want everything real dark, uh, super dark shadows. So by, by shooting stuff in log, they have a much larger range to play with. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to emulate a log footage by pulling our contrast down and pulling our saturation down. <clears throat> now, let me go back and I'm going to turn on this color correction. Okay. So this is your standard Lumion image. And do you see how oversaturated everything is? I mean, the greens are just crazy. And, you know, these reds are just, everything is just oversaturated. So we turn back on this color correction, turn down your saturation, turn down your contrast. You're more in that log range. All right. So then let's talk about our render settings. Our render settings, we will always render things out in the highest quality, this five star. Um, depending on where we're sending this footage will determine, you know, these next two things. If we are sending this footage out to a client, meaning it's going out over the internet, we are only going to render out at 30 frames per second, and we're going to go at 1920 by 1080. Um, if we are if we know that the client is coming into our office, then we're going to go ahead and render out at 60 frames per second, and we're going to go ultra HD. Now, we actually run 4K monitors here in the office, and we have 4K TVs in our conference room, so it makes sense for us to run something out at ultra HD. If you don't have the capability, if you don't have a 4K TV to view this on, there's absolutely no reason to run this out uh, at ultra HD. Just stay at your 30 frames per second and go your 1920 by 1080. Your Ultra HD is an exceptionally large file. Um, just stay in that 30 by 1920. Render this out and you're ready to jump over into Resolve. All right, so we are now in DaVinci Resolve and um, let, let's talk a little bit about Resolve. Um, DaVinci Resolve was initially uh, developed for color grading. DaVinci Resolve is actually used in major motion pictures today. I think that um, I read somewhere like 25 or 28 major motion pictures last year were actually uh, color graded in DaVinci Resolve. Um, you, this product is produced by a company called Blackmagic and you can go to the Blackmagic website and you can download DaVinci Resolve for absolutely free. Um, extremely affordable, right? Um, we actually run the studio version here in the office. It just comes with a little more bells and whistles, uh, things that we like to play with. But even that is, is extremely affordable. I think it's something like $299. Um, and extremely affordable, especially when you're used to um, the Adobe platform. Um, now, the thing about Resolve is that there is no way that we can talk about everything that this program can do for you. Um, this is a monster, monster program. Um, it's a little bit like Amanda asking us to 
do a webinar on everything that LandFX can do for you and you have 20 minutes to talk about it. So just know that we can't dig into everything, but we are going to get you into this. We're going to build a timeline today. We're going to do some edits. We're going to do some color grading and then deliver it out. Kind of pique your interest in this. So let's talk a little bit um, about Resolve. I'm going to save this project. Okay, so we have these uh, seven tabs down here in the bottom. And you can think of each one of these tabs as a completely separate program. Uh, especially if you're used to dealing with Premiere Pro and the Adobe platform. So your media page is going to be like Bridge, where this is where we're bringing in all of our media into our project. Um, our cut page is going to be a lot like Prelude. Uh, the cut page, you can do some simple edits on, some quick edits on, but the cut page is really meant for very large projects where we're dealing with multiple timelines. The edit page is we're going to spend quite a bit of uh, time on the edit page today. And this is where we actually create our entire production. So this is where we're going to add video, add music. This is where you do all of your titles. Uh, you can add effects here, your transitions, your cuts, your, your deletes. The fusion page, the fusion page is a lot like after effects. Um, this is where you build all of your effects for your presentation. Any type of 3D text or particles that explode, um, text that moves, it's going to be built here in the, the Fusion page. The color page, obviously this is where we color our, our film and we're going to spend quite a bit of time here. The fair light page is where you do all of your sound. So this is all your music mixing, voiceovers, you have full EQs here, lots of different cool you know, toys to play with here, extremely powerful page. And then your deliver, your deliver is just basically where it all comes together and you send it out to, to render. So let's jump on the media page and, and get started. Um, top of the page, you have a viewer. Bottom of the page, you have in DaVinci, these are called bins. And this is basically where you're bringing all of your information in that you want to use in your project. If you'll jump over, sorry, if you'll jump over here to this media storage, this window pops up and these are basically all your drives that are on your system. So if we go over here to the C drive, Dropbox. I double click this LandFX webinar, another window opens. And this is, this section here is looking at this folder. So these are all of the different media um, that we have on this file. So we can double click on this and we can view this over in the uh, viewer. This is just a still image. This is a still image. And here's our park rendered number four. And this is actually the file that we, that we rendered out of Lumion. So you can scrub through this just to kind of view to make sure that this is the correct, you know, file that you want to work with. You can set in and out points on this. And an in and out point is meaning that you only want to use a small portion of this. You don't want to bring this entire thing into your project. We can just click on an end point, click here, click on an out point, drag this down to this bin, and we're only using that small portion. Okay, so we want to use this entire file. And the easiest way to get it down into your project, because remember, this is still only on my computer. I'm only looking at this back on my drives. So the easiest way to get this in my project is a left click, pull it down and release. Okay, so we've already loaded all of this different media. We've got some stills in here. We've got our park render. We have some music here. Um, we're ready to go. Once you have all of your video and all of your media down into your bin, you want to window select on all of this. You want to right click and you want to generate optimized me media. And by generating optimized media, what that does for you is that DaVinci is going to run in the background and it's going to build proxy files for each one of these files. And all that means is that it is pre-rendering all of this information so that when you put it and drop it down onto a timeline later, all of the, the hard work is already done. Okay, so we've loaded in all of our media. We're ready to go over to the edit page and start building a project. So in the edit page, 
we have two viewers, a left and a right, uh, and we have a timeline down at the bottom. If you'll click on your media pool here, this window on the left appears, and this is all of your media that you loaded back in, back at the media page, right? So here's all of our, here are all of our files, back on the edit page, here are all of our files. It's an exact mirror. Okay, if we double click on one of these, you'll see the window on the left um, appears. And again, this is just a viewer of your media that is in your project. We have not added this to a timeline yet. So again, we can scrub through this, decide do we want to use the entire thing? Do we want to use in and out points? We wanna use the entire thing. Easiest way to add this to a timeline is just left click on it, drag, drag it down to your video section. Okay, so then the window on the right just appeared, right? And that's because the window on the right is looking only at your timeline. Window on the left is looking at just media files that are in your media pool. Okay, so you'll notice that when I added this, I added a video file and I added an audio file. Now, every time that you render out of Lumion, you're going to get an audio file. Even if you did not do any type of sound effect, you're going to get an audio file. You can simply left click on this, right click, and delete selected. Get rid of that audio file. Let me show you one other way to load uh, media. I'm still on this render number four. I'm in my viewer. You see these two little icons down here? This icon on the left is your video only. Icon on the right is your sound only. So there'll be times that you're bringing media in that you wanna only use the video or only use the audio. So here, we can just click on this left icon, drag this straight down to our timeline, and boom, we've just loaded our, our video file without that dead audio file. Does that make sense? All right. Let's come up here to this icon, click on it. This will give us a single viewer now. A single viewer, uh, DaVinci's smart enough to know where you're working. If you're down in your timeline, your viewer's looking at your timeline. If you're over in your media pool, your viewer is looking at your media pool. Okay, so let's talk about how you play things in your viewer several different ways. Uh, we actually have a play button down here that we can click, play through at normal speed. We've got a stop button. You've seen me grab these little icons here and just drag or scrub through the file. So this is really good if you're trying to jump, you know, to different portions of your video. You can grab your playhead down here, do the same thing. You've got shortcut keys of J, K, and L. J is playing things in reverse, K is stop, L is forward, K is stop, and your uh, space bar is always play and always stop. So that's how you play through, through your videos in your, in your viewer. All right, so we're now ready to start editing. And um, which what we normally do is, you know, we'll just hit our space bar, play through this at normal speed, try to find some areas that, that need some work. You can hit your L key um, several times to speed this up. And you're just looking for things that you want to edit. So we're coming up on this plaza here, we're panning left, we're panning right. And then we've got this weird dead space. And then we jump over to our mail kiosk. Now that looks kind of weird, we don't want that. So let's cut that out. I'm gonna grab my playhead and I'm just gonna back this up. I'm now using my J key, just so that it runs in reverse. Right here, I wanna split this clip. Well, I can come to this blade tool here. I can just left click on this, pull it down to the timeline, click on it, and I just split the clip into two clips. So we were, we had an original single clip, now I'm in, in two clips. I drag this playhead over until we get to that mail kiosk and I need to dial this in. So I'm using my right arrow keys and my left arrow keys. And if you'll notice this number right here, this is the number of frames that are in our project. I'm just right arrowing until I jump to that mail kiosk. 
left, right. Right here, I want to split this again using the blade tool. Split that clip. So now I have I have three different clips, right? And I want to I want to delete this. So I'm just left clicking on this. I'll right click on this. And I'm going to delete selected. So I just got rid of our clip, but it left this little hole in here. That's not really what we want. Let's control Z. I can left click on this to select, right click, and I can come up here and I can do a, a ripple delete or just hit my delete button. And what a ripple delete will do for you is it'll grab that selection, throw it away, take everything to the right of your selection and move it back to the left so that we do not have that little space anymore. And now we've got a really nice clean transition there. So you're going to go through your entire clips using your blade tool. And, you know, maybe you just want to, you want to find some different scenes. Maybe right here where we're going from this swing set over to this west end of this uh, park. We want, we want to set a transition right there. So I'm just using my right arrow keys until I find that jump. As soon as I jump, I grab the blade tool, split the clip. Now I'll be able to insert a transition here and have a real nice uh, pattern. And so you'll just go through your entire clip and you'll just cut it at different areas, uh, whatever works for you. You know, we've got this night scene in here. Maybe we'll split it right before we go to night. Somewhere in there, that's fine. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six clips now from our single clip. And this is the poor, this is the part that we would now come in and add music. And unfortunately, because of the Zoom app, you guys can't hear what's coming out of our speakers, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on music today. But there are a couple of things that I want to talk to you about. So I think music is a huge portion of getting a video, I mean a, a cinematic feel, right? I mean, think about going to the movies and um, how, how much of a role the music plays. There are all kinds of different subscription-based websites that you can get music from. Uh, we belong to a couple of different ones. Um, LandFX did a webinar several months ago on video presentations and uh, they talked about Scott Holmes music. We use some of Scott Holmes. I think Scott Holmes is even in the original clip that we did on this, um, on this series. Uh, we use a lot of music from YouTube. Uh, they have a lot of free music. Uh, just make sure that you're following their copyright rules. Um, generally, you can use their stuff for free as long as you give them a shout out, you know, at the end of your, your production. So um, just want to cover just a little bit on music and show you that music always comes into your um, project as a waveform. And a waveform is showing you nothing more than how loud or how soft your music is, or where do you have peaks that these are gonna be accents, right? So you always want to be cutting to the music, which means that we've got a peak right here, right? We're crescendoing this music up, and we've got this loud peak right here, which means there, there is an accent here. We want to make sure that that peak is lining up with this cut. It's going to make a lot more sense to you visually. Um, and unfortunately, you guys can't hear it. You're just going to have to kind of trust me on that. Um, on, on music, uh, a couple other things. You know, right here on the edit page, we can grab these top corners and we can fade this music in. We can fade, we can fade this music out. These little control points in the middle, uh, we can hover right over and we can ease this music in and ease out, or we can do the reverse of that. And my cursor's jumping for some reason. Um, and then this line that runs down right through the middle of this, this is actually your volume control. So you can grab this and adjust your volume up or down. Um, and then you can right click on this and you can, um, Oh, normalize audio levels and a minus nine is fine. Hit normalize. And now uh, you normally want to be between a minus nine and a minus 10 on all of your music. And you won't be, you know, um, overplaying your music in your video. That's about all we can talk about with, with music. Um, since you guys can't, can't hear this. Uh, but now we will go through and we will add transitions to our cuts. 
So let's close out of this media pool here. Come up here to this effects library. Go over to your toolbox, video transitions. And uh, DaVinci actually ships with all of these different transitions. Even the free version has all of these transitions. Um, and what I mean by a transition, let's get you in here a little bit. You see right here, we have a cut. So if we were to come across this, we just had this real hard cut, right? We want to ease, we want to ease through that trend or through that cut. So if you'll come down here, most uh, of the time we use this cross dissolve, just left click on this, pull it right in the middle of your clip. And we have just set a cross dissolve. And you see this little red line here that appeared? The little red line is telling us that the software is actually caching out or rendering out this transition. As soon as that little line turns blue, we're ready to play this, ready to view this. So you see how nice that transition is now? That's a cross dissolve. Okay, and then once you find a transition that works very well, you know, you're just gonna play with a lot of these, you can right click on this and you can set as your standard transition. And then if you just hover over a clip, you can right click and you can choose your frame rate and that cross resolve, cross dissolve will always be added there for you. Okay, so that's about it on the edit page. I'm sorry, we could probably do an entire webinar on the edit page, but we need to get you over to color because we are running out of time. Okay, so we are on the color page now. We have a viewer up here in the top left and we have a node tree over on the right. And the uh, DaVinci Resolve is a node-based program. Um, nodes work a lot like layers uh, from Photoshop. Uh, basically, you have your original image coming in. We're sending that image into this node and this node is, we are applying some type of color correction to it. And then we are sending it out to a final render, right? So if we had uh, several nodes here, remember in Photoshop, the top layer controls, right? So this is what our node structure would look like if we were in Photoshop. So our image is coming in, we're making correction, 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 top layer controls, we're sending it out to our final image. Our viewer here is always looking at our final image. All right, and then we have our different clips here. And one thing I want you to see is that back on the edit page, we had one, two, three, four, five, we have six clips, right? So over in the color page, we have six clips. So this is just a mirror image of your edit page. And we can color grade each one of these clips individually. And then we've got our tools section down here. So let me back out of this just a little bit. Let's jump back over to um, PowerPoint. Sorry, I said PowerPoint. Wow, sorry guys. Need to go to PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, back in PowerPoint. Couple of things we need to talk about on color grading before we get started. Uh, some terms, color management, color correction, and color grading. So, you know, as you start digging into coloring, um, you're gonna start seeing these terms quite a bit and they're, they, I just need to explain them to you so you know what you're, what you're talking about. Color management, color management is nothing more than how software handles imported files to color, right? So if you're shooting in log or you're shooting in Canon or, or red, um, the, the software needs to understand what file format you are actually shooting in so that your reds are reds, your greens are greens, and your blues are blues, right? Color correction is really more of a technical process to deal with color issues to make footage appear natural. And we've all had this where you've taken your phone out to a project that you're working on, you've taken a bunch of pictures, you come back to the office to show everyone, 
and everything is red or everything's overexposed. Well, color correction is how we get back to make that footage appear natural, right? And then color grading is nothing more than style. It's the creative side. And this is what big film is doing. Big film is doing color grading um, to produce emotion and to produce atmosphere. And again, it's just the creative style. So color terms that we need to talk about, hue, saturation, and luminance. Hue is nothing more than color. And, you know, when you and I talk and we say something's blue or something's red, we're talking about the color. Well, actually, it's, it's called hue. Saturation is the intensity of a color in an image. So as we move closer to the middle of a color wheel, we're desaturating an image. And the opposite, when we're moving to the outside, we're increasing saturation. And then luminance is nothing more than the perceived brightness of a color. And we'll deal with luminance quite a bit in DaVinci. Color terms, temperature, tint, and contrast. Temperature is always dealing with your oranges to your blues, right? So think about, uh, again, a romantic comedy. Um, those things are always gonna lean towards orange. They're always gonna have lots of yellows, lots of high contrast. And, you know, the opposite in horror, horror films are going to be leaning towards blue and teal. Now, tint is dealing with magentas and greens. So when you're correcting tint, you are, you're correcting your magenta and green. So specifically in DaVinci Resolve, temperature is blue to orange and tint is green to magenta. And then contrast is nothing more than the relationship between the darkest and the brightest parts of an image. So high contrast images have very dark shadows and very bright highlights. That's big film. Low contrast images, they all lean towards gray and they're, they're gonna look very flat. That's kind of that D log where we were coming out of Lumion. And if you guys are really trying to get a more cinematic feel, it's high contrast and it's all teal and orange. And what we mean by that is, look at all these highlights in these clouds. Everything is leaning towards orange and your shadows are leaning towards teal. And then big film today, I mean, just look at all of this big film. Everything that you see is teal and orange. And so by comparison, we have this, this Lumion render image on the left, and this has zero color grading applied. And you see how oversaturated everything is in this? I mean, these greens are crazy. The sky is this funky blue. Uh, that mulch color is even kind of odd. And then, you know, this kid way here in the back, I mean, his shirt's so oversaturated that you can see him, you know, from half a mile away. As we're over on the right-hand side, you know, our skies are not, you know, this crazy blue. Uh, we've added the orange into all of our clouds. We've desaturated the image. And then all of our shadows are leaning towards that blue teal. All right, so this is what we're trying to, this is what we're trying to get away from because there's no park in the world that looks this color. This is what we're trying to do today. All right, so back into Resolve, and let's do some color grading. All right, so I'm gonna close down this section right here just to give you guys a little more room to, to see what we're doing. All right, so you just wanna kinda get to a, a good starting point. Say something like here, it doesn't really matter. Um, just something that you can go back to. And the first thing that you always want to do on an image is you want to set your white balance. So we are in this node right here. Any, any correction that we make down here is going to live in this node, right? So if we come down here to the lower left-hand corner and we just click on this white balance, we can then go up into the image and we can click on anything that is white or neutral. So we click on that. We've just set our white point for this image. Now, this kind of brings up a good spot to talk about scopes. Scopes, um, scopes are your technical information of what's going on in your image. And um, DaVinci actually ships with Parade, Wave, Vector, Histogram, and CIE scopes. We live mainly on the Parade scope. You will use some waveform um, as you get more and more into it, but Parade's a really good place to, to start. 
And as I scrub, you know, just watch these, watch these scopes over here. As I scrub through this footage, see how those scopes are dancing all over the place? Well, that's because I've got pixels that are moving, right? Our image is moving around, so our pixels are moving around. Let me back up just a little bit. Right in here. Okay, so a parade scope over a histogram. The nice thing about parade is parade is actually reading your red channel, your green channel, and your blue channel right? And um, zero is pure black. 1023 is pure white. And just so that you know, most monitors and most TVs today cannot read above 896. So as you do all of your color grading, you don't want pixels up here in this above this 896. They'll get clipped out. Now, the, the other thing that's really cool about Parade is, over histogram is that Parade is reading your image from left to right. So if we go up here and we look at our image, this left-hand side of the image is a lot brighter than our right side because we've got all shadow over here, right? And so that's exactly what our scopes are showing us down here, that we've got in our red, green, and our blue channel, we have brighter pixels on the left side of the image than we do on the right side of the image. Does that make sense? All right, so you just wanna kind of keep an eye on those. We'll talk more about scopes as we go through. Okay, so we already set our white balance in this node. Now I can click on this number one right here and I can turn this off and watch my scopes down here. Turn it on. See how my scopes jumped? Turn it off. Not a big move, but basically what happened is that this red channel came up. We said that we wanted this to be our white point. So DaVinci went in and it balanced our image out. So now we have our red, our green, and our blue that all look pretty good and our image has warmed up a little bit because we added to the red channel. All right, so let's right click on this, let's node label this, and let's call this our white balance. All right, so we don't wanna do anything else in this channel or on this layer because we've already set this white balance. We don't want this to change. So we can go in here and right click on this and we can add a node and we just wanna add a serial node. And a serial node is nothing more than, think of it as another layer, you know, down the chain. And here, let's node label this, right click, node label. Let's correct our contrast and our exposure. Okay, so there's many ways to do everything in color grading. There's no one right way to do this stuff. Um, today, we're just kind of trying to explain the logic of DaVinci and you're going to figure out what works for you. But um, let, let's talk about contrast and a couple different ways that we can, we can correct this contrast. If we come down here to this lower uh, section, we have these, these sliders at the bottom. Um, we have a contrast that we can just click on and we can roll this to the right and watch my image. See how I'm adding just a tremendous amount of contrast. If I roll this back to the left, you can see that I'm taking contrast away. Anytime that you need to reset these, you can just double click on the word. That'll set us back to our original image. So that's one way to add contrast. The other way to add contrast is going through our curves. So we can just come into our curves and set a point and just build our little normal S curve like we always did in Photoshop. And pull these highlights down just a hair. Okay, so that looks pretty good on our contrast. Pull this down just a bit. And now we're gonna go through and just kind of roll forward just to have a look. Make sure that we didn't you know, change something really dr drastically. You see this tree right here? This is looking pretty dark. So we've already set our contrast through our, our, through our curve here, right? So now we wanna be working on exposure. So we've got these wheels down here on the left-hand side. We've got lift, gamma, gain, and offset. And you can think of these as shadows, midtones, and highlights, and then an overall. So your lift is going to be your shadows, right? So this dark portion of the image. Underneath these color wheels, we have these luminance sliders. So this is our luminance slider for our shadows. So I'm going to left click on this, and I'm just going to roll this to the right. And you see my shadow up there? I was just getting a little bit brighter. It's just opening up that tree. Looks so much better. 
Okay, so now let's scroll back. Uh, see this house over here? So we lightened up our shadows, but now our house over here on the right-hand side is kind of blown out. Well, we can come over here on the gamma. We can adjust the luminance. So I'm just gonna grab this luminance slider and I'm just gonna click on it and I'm just gonna roll this back to the left. Do a little bit on the gain, which is the high side. Pull that down. Something like that. Now we just brought a whole bunch back into our house. Roll up here. Oh, our, our shadows got dark again. So just lighten up that shadow on that, that luminance wheel. And that looks pretty good right there. So let's get you to a full screen. And let's go. Um... Okay, this was our original image coming out of Lumion. This was our this was our log footage, if you will, and this is with our new correction. So all we've done is set a white balance, and we've set our content. And just look how much more three D this looks. All right. So the next thing that we're going to do, let's go Alt S, add another node. We don't want to mess with this contrast. We're going to right click on this. We're going to node label this saturation. Anytime that you play with contrast and exposure, you need to play with saturation. So let's back off just a hair. We'll come right down here to the lower left-hand co uh, corner and we have a saturation. Now this slider, on all these sliders on the bottom, what I like to do is go way past what I think looks good and then pull back to dial it in. So I'm just left clicking on this, I'm rolling this all the way to the right. I'm 100%, so I'm super oversaturated, which looks a lot like our original Lumion image, right? And you, you guys might like that. That might work for you guys. So if we just grab this again, I'm left clicking on it. I'm just kind of dialing this back into what looks good to me. And about 64 looks good. Okay, get you over to a full screen. That's where we started in Lumion. That's where we are now, okay? All right, so white balance, contrast and exposure, and saturation. This is our color correction. Remember we were talking the difference between color correction and color grading? All right, these three nodes here are our color correction. Now we're start reading, we are ready to start doing what we call color grading, establishing our style. So let's work on this grass just a little bit. Let's come over here and go Alt-S to add another serial node. I'm going to right click on this and I want to add a different type of node. I want to add a layer node here. And the only reason that I'm adding a layer node here is I want to explain to you guys that things in DaVinci are exactly opposite of uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. Meaning here we have a layer node in Photoshop our top layer controls. Well in DaVinci your bottom layer controls. So if this was Photoshop, our layer stack would look like this. Got it? Okay. So let's call this grass, node label grass. All right, so we only wanna work on the grass, so we need to mask out the rest of our, our image, right? Well, in DaVinci, masks are called qualifiers. So this little button right here is called your qualifier tool. You can click on this. I'm coming up to my image. I'm left clicking on my grass. I'm holding down the button and I'm just dragging across my grass. And it doesn't look like anything changed. Well, if we come up here to the highlight tool and we click on this, you can see everything that just turned gray has been masked out, right? Okay, well, this isn't a very clean mask. Well, every time that you use a qualifier, this little section pulls up a hue, saturation, luminance, and a matte finesse area. So we can play with these sliders to clean this mask up. And the easiest way to clean up a mask is always start on your luminance, come to your low side, left click on this, and start cranking this to the right. And you see how I've really cleaned up that image? We still have a little bit of wall in here. We still have a little bit of post in here. So I'll come up here to the hue area. and I can just play with this width a little bit. See if I can't get it a little cleaner. I can also click on this 
and just m move my center to really kind of dial that in. Somewhere right in there is pretty good for us. Um, we can go to the, um, we can change this image to a, a black and white also to see what we're really changing. So black is being masked out, white is what we're affecting. And we can come down to this matte finesse area and we can left click on this clean black and watch my blacks. See, I just clean those up, clean my whites. We'll denoise this image a little bit and all I'm doing is left clicking and rolling to the right. And I'll give it a little bit of blur just so, you know, just like in Photoshop, you don't want that real stark line. We can go back to our colored image and now look how clean our mask is. So the only thing we're gonna be affecting is our grass. And we can turn this off so you can see what kind of corrections I'm gonna make. All right, so we're in this, this grass node and we can, um, we, we need to adjust this. And we can make these adjustments on the same node. So we can have our, our mask and our adjustments in the, living in the same node. I'm gonna hit save. All right, so let's go over to our curves. And in the curve section, we have several different curves that you can play with. Um, we have our standard custom curve. We've got hue versus hue, hue versus saturation, hue versus luminance, luminance versus saturation, and sat versus sat. If you'll come over here to the second curve, which is called hue versus hue, I'm gonna go up into the image and I'm gonna click on this grass. And if you look right down here, you can see that DaVinci set three control points for me. The center control point is the actual color of the pixel that I selected, and the left and the right are just controls, so that if I move this, we're affecting a range color from here to here. I always like to open this range up by holding S and left clicking, S and left clicking, and then we can right click to delete, right click to delete. Excuse me, now we're going to move this center point to adjust our hue. So watch the color of the grass. You can get some really funky looks just by moving this just a hair. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. And we can go blue. We just want to, you know, if you are doing some type of fall render, you know, maybe have it fall in there and that, that's the look you're going for. You know, they're, they're calling this grading because it's just, what do you think looks good? We just want to add a little bit of green hue to this. And we'll slide you up in the, so we can see this grass a little bit better. So we changed our hue. Now we're going to come in here, click this number two. We're going to grab this MD, a mid-tone detail. And we're just going to crank this up. And mid-tone detail works a lot like your vibrant slider in, in uh, Lightroom. So you don't want to go crazy with this, um, probably something 40, 46, something like that. All right, let's get you out to a full screen view. Let's go. Okay, so what you're looking at right now, I'll back you up just a hair. Um, this, this grass section right here and here, I am just turning off that, that grass um, node that we just set. So that's with it on, that's with it off. That's with it on, that's with it off. You just see how much 3D we've added and how much detail we've added? Okay, so that is grass. Um, we talked about cinematic looks that we need teal and orange. And the easiest way to add some teal is to correct the sky. So if we go to this mixer, let's hit Alt S. We're gonna add the serial node. Let's label this sky so you guys can follow along. I'm still on my hue versus hue. I'm just clicking in this blue sky. I set three points here just by clicking that blue sky. Let's widen this out just a little bit. Shift left, shift left. I'm right clicking to open this up. And you can see this histogram in the background. These are all of your pixels that are actually in this image. All right, so let's grab this center point and let's just move this around and watch the sky. So you can get some really funky, you know, Wizard of Oz looks if you, if, 
if that's what you want, if that's what you guys are into. You know, we just want to add some teal. So we can just pull this down. I'll make sure we add a little more than normally would just so you guys can see it in the webinar. Okay, so go to full screen, see our new sky, how teal it is. That's with it off. That's where we came out of Lumion. That's with it on. Okay, so uh, after sky, we'll normally go in and we'll work on skin tones. Uh, we'll add some power windows to soften some things up and maybe sharpening some things. We're not going to do that because we are we are really pushing time here. Um, but just a couple couple more nodes here. Uh, Alt S. We're going to call this our teal and orange. T N O T A O for short. Okay, so we really haven't talked a whole lot about our color wheels, and I want to just explain those a bit before you guys go. Primary wheels and log wheels. Primary wheels are for making very large adjustments to your image. Um, log wheels are going to adjust a very a much smaller uh, area of the image. Um, let, let me just show you. We're, we're in this teal and orange uh, node, so we can correct back out of it. But remember we talked about lift, gamma, and gain, right? If we come over to the lift and I grab this puck in the middle and I pull this all the way over to the right, look at my image. Do you see how blue the entire image is? Okay, let's reset by hitting this button right here. If we go over to log wheels, we grab this same puck under shadows, and we pull this over all the way towards blue. See how different the image looks? That's because we moved a much smaller section of pixels. Um, log just kind of dials things in. Um, so primary, primary wheels are for big moves. And if you guys are shooting a lot of drone footage uh, or actual camera footage that you need to correct, you're probably going to start in primary uh, and get it close in your corrections and then jump over to wheels to, I'm sorry, to log to really dial it in. All right, so teal and orange. Let's jump over to the log wheels. A classic teal and orange look. Your shadows are going to lean towards blue. Your midtones are going to lean towards teal green. And your highlights are going to really push towards orange. So we're on this node in our shadows. Let's just pull these shadows over to blue. Something like that. Our midtones, let's just pull this towards teal green. It doesn't need a lot, something like that. Now, watch the clouds. I'm in my highlights. I'm just pushing this all the way up to orange. And I'm kind of overdoing it to make sure you guys can really see it on the, on the monitor. Okay, full screen. Um, I'm turning off that teal and orange. That's all I'm changing. Look at my sky. Do you see how that made that sky just really pop? Look at these uh, red yuccas here. This is with it off. This is with it on. Let me roll you up just a little bit. Look at this wall. That's with my uh, orange highlights turned off. Look how gray everything looks. Turn it on and all your highlights you know, just came up. Look at her skin. Look how green it was before we added those, those highlights. So that's your typical teal and orange. All right, one more node that we need to talk about, um, and then we'll move forward. This is going to be called node label. Let's call this shadows. So uh, one trick of big film or big cinema is desaturating your shadows. So you need to do this on all of your shots. Let's come down here, second from the end. And we've got luminance versus saturation. Um, we've got two buttons down here. Let's click on both of those. This button set this control. This button set this control. What this graph is telling us right now is that everything from this point to the left is falling in shadows in our image, and everything from this point forward is in our highlights. We want to desaturate our shadows, even though you know, in this T and O node, uh, we, we, we made all of these shadows blue. Well, in big film, you want the deepest, darkest portion of your shadow to be black. And then you want the rest of the shadow to roll off towards that teal blue. 
So if we just come down here and we grab this end node and we crank this all the way down to the bottom, we just desaturated the deepest portion of the shadow to pure black. Then we're rolling everything else off to that teal blue. We'll generally come in here, set a midpoint, and we'll just crank up our midtones just to add a little more saturation. All right. Okay, so um, this at this point, we would normally go in and we would add sharpness or we would add grain or some lens flare effects. But this right here is pretty well uh, color graded. Uh, again, these three nodes are your color correction. All of these nodes at the end are your color grade, right? All right, let's turn our clips back on. Remember, we only graded one clip here, and now you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, I've got you know five more clips that I've got to do this to. Well, the answer is no. Um, if we double or if we click on this number two clip, you see how we're back to that flat image? Look at these numbers here also. Around our number one, we have this rainbow. This rainbow is telling us that um, this, this clip has been graded. We don't have a rainbow here, so we need to apply all of this color grading to number two. All you have to do is select the clip that you want to apply your color grading to, hover over the clip that you want to grab the color grading from, and center mouse wheel click. We just added this from number one to number two. Go to number three, hover over number one, center mouse wheel. Number four, center mouse wheel. Now you would, would go to number two, you would fly through your scene and okay, maybe these clouds are a little blown out in this scene so you can jump back into your contrast and exposure, check that and make some small adjustments, but you're not recoloring every clip and that way when you render this out, all your greens are gonna be the same. It's all gonna look like it matches. All right, one last thing to talk about in color. If we go up here to gallery and um, let's say this number one clip, you guys really like what you did and you wanna be able to apply this to every project, right? You don't wanna go through all of this long drawn out process. You can just grab your clip, right click on this and you can grab a still. When you grab a still, you just copied all of this information onto this still. We can grab this still and we can put it into power grades. Now the reason that you need to put it into power grades and not leave it in stills is power grades are brought in to every single project. Stills only are living in this project. So we open up our power grades, we just added this. Now if we send out another project from Lumion that we want to color grade, we can simply throw it on the color page, double click this box and we'll apply, apply this exact color grade um, to, to the new clip. Does that make sense? All right, so you're done color grading. You're going over to the deliver page and I promise guys, we are almost home. I know Amanda's sweating. Um, we, we are in the uh, deliver page now. We've got a viewer up here. We've got our clips. We've got our timeline. Um, da Vinci ships with all of these presets. So if you're sending stuff out to YouTube, you can simply click on this and send it out. Vimeo, same way. We will normally um, render out all of our videos on this H.264 codec. Uh, very, very uh, common codec that most computers can read today. So we'll just click on that. We'll name our file. We'll decide where we're sending it to. Over on render, you just want to click single clip. You can render out individual clips. That just means that you're going to get six different movies here instead of one single clip, right? Go to your format, choose, do you want to go QuickTime or do you want to go MP4? You're going to click down here, add to render queue. When you go to render queue, it's going to load up here and you're going to click start render. DaVinci is extremely powerful. This little five or six minute movie, this will probably render out in, I don't know, 45 seconds to a minute and you're done. Amanda, we're done. I'm sorry that took so long, guys. My name's Pat Pabish. You can shoot me an email at pat at ytlinc.com. Amanda, what do you have? No, that was 
a lot of great information, Pat, I think. Um, and I really do appreciate you explaining your, your workflow so thoroughly to help everybody understand how you make that final video. I think that it, going through that step by step uh, probably have raised a lot of um, thoughts with a lot of people about how they should probably do this. I, I mean, to remind everybody uh, that as a guest presenter, Pat wanted to share what he's found is important for video creation that maybe a lot of people don't really think about when they first start out with videos. Uh, and I agree that now after listening to Pat, uh, that color correction, while it isn't normally thought about until you get uh, pretty far into making videos, that uh, it's really an important thing to probably start thinking about. And this was a great introduction on why it should probably be important to elevate the quality of presentations that we as landscape architects and designers are making. Uh, so we have a few minutes for some questions that came up. So um, really quick then, uh, back to Lumion. Uh, uh, Frank saw that you input your land effects planting node file at 0, 0,5, 0. But he asked, how did you set the previous site to 0, 0,5, 0 as well? OK, so let me jump over there, Amanda. It's basically, uh, you just decide what looks good to you, to be very honest with you. Um, we want, get you back over there. When you bring in this, this site um, base file, you can set that base file anywhere that you want to set it, okay? So um, a lot of times when we, when we are building in SketchUp, we're actually working at true elevation, right? And the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we're around 600. So our, our, our site is gonna be at 600 feet in the air. So if, if, we, if we left it there, that site file at 600, when we brought it into Lumion, our site file would be 600 feet in the air. Does that make sense? So we will, um, a lot of times when we get our site file, we will, done in SketchUp, we'll drop it really close to the, um, to the zero elevation, but we still have, you know, five to seven feet maybe of elevation change in this park. So we need to make sure that our, our model is sitting above this, this terrain, this open plain in Lumion. So the number doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what elevation you set it at as long as you understand that all the files need to be at that number. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Um, another question, uh, I think the final question for today, so if you could answer it like within a minute and a half, um, <laughs> what I wanted to focus on was uh, about DaVinci Resolve in general. I, I know that you covered it a little bit at the beginning, you talked about this, Pat, but could you speak more on why you chose DaVinci Resolve for video editing and color correction, both in the first place, um, as like using a, vid, a color corrector and then a, as opposed to other video editing software. I know you mentioned Lightroom at one point during the presentation. Uh, there were some questions about the cost benefit. Is it a free software or is it another software you purchased along with Land Effects and Lumion to add to the workflow? No, so you, <clears throat> excuse me, you can, you can download DaVinci Resolve 16 for free from Blackmagic. So go to the Blackmagic website, download DaVinci Resolve. You will have 99%. Well, everything that we covered today, you will have. Um, we, we just run the studio version. There's just a couple little bells and whistles that we like. It has to do with camera stabilization on our drones, that kind of stuff. But for just Lumion rendering, the free version will work absolutely fine with you. Um, so again, down at the bottom, you have all these, me these different tabs. The, the Adobe platform, each one of these is a separate piece of software, right? So, you know, you've got your Premiere Pro, you've got your After Effects, um, you've got, you know, Media Encoder, uh, Audition, that you are sending files back and forth. Well, it's so convenient. The thing that, the reason that we went with DaVinci is it is so convenient. This is all in one file. We're not exporting and importing a bunch of stuff. And then again, for color, DaVinci just leads the, um, the software world in their, in their color correction. So that's why we went with DaVinci. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, hope you got a chance to see the final full video in the links in the chat. We're going to be including it uh, with the recording. Uh, thank you again, Pat, for taking time out of your busy day uh, to explain your video creation workflow. Do you have any final thoughts before we wish everybody a great weekend? No, just stay safe, everyone, in this crazy time. Thanks, Pat. Bye, everybody. <laughs>